Well, good morning. That is absolutely pathetic. What have you been doing with these people here? Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you, you need to practice your voice for later on, okay, for something we're going to do later on together. So we'll have one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we're nearly there. I'm, uh, I'm Pastor David. I'm actually one of the pastors here, though some of you won't have met me before. Um, it's a bit strange today, actually. It's, this is my 29th time that I've been here for a Greenford Baptist Church anniversary. It's the first time I've ever preached at it. It's the first time I've ever been the visiting speaker, isn't that uh, that strange? Most of you will know that I'm currently seconded to a church in East London. I was asked to go there in February last year. Um, The church was in a complete mess, having had uh, an absolutely horrendous leadership failure. Um, I'm pleased to say that things are going really well. The the church congregation has doubled in size. We've had a couple of baptisms this year. First baptisms the church has seen for six years. Um, Not just that, last Sunday, this is really hot off the press news. Last Sunday, we had a members meeting and we have called a full-time pastor starting at, uh, going to start in the autumn but here's the thing, we, this church has had a real problems with leadership. We had a secret ballot for this lady pastor that's coming. She got 89.6% of the vote. Yes. So just a real sense of God's activity and God's presence at, at the church. My, my work there's nearly finished. I'll be finishing there at the end of June. And uh, from the first Sunday in July, I'm going to be back here uh, every Sunday. You, so you can be pleased about that, if you are. <laughs> in, in July, I'm going to be working here in, in preparation for August, because in August, I'm leading a team from Greenford Baptist Church to Mozambique. And uh, this is going with BMS World Mission. I was hoping to introduce the whole team to you this morning, but one of them is currently, I spoke to him a few minutes ago, He's cooking lasagna. (laughs) How long does it take to cook lasagna? Absolutely. Uh, So Chris Davies not here, but we'll be here later. But Hegiani is here. Hegiani, can you come and come and join me? So uh, Hegiani, and you'll have to imagine Chris here and Hegiani. Uh, We're going to uh, Mozambique um, on behalf of Greenford Baptist Church. It's the first ever. Um, church mission team that's gone with BMS to Mozambique. We're going to a place called um, Berea in, uh, in Mozambique. It's not the capital. It's actually not an easy place to get to, as we've discovered, having booked the flights. Um, it's absolutely a right pain to get to, but that's where we're going to. We're going to be based there for two weeks. Um, in the first week, uh, we're running a training course. There are 40 people coming to this course. Uh, and we're doing teaching, theological teaching, and uh, education with them. We're also doing some stuff with um, women's work and with uh, youth stuff, and we're uh, preaching in churches on Sundays as well. All the details are not all sorted out yet, but that's roughly roughly where we're going. Um, so there'll be the three of us going, and uh, we're going to be asking you, uh, we're going to be talking about it almost every week from the beginning of July, because we really need you praying for us as we go into this context. Uh, BMS have been working in Mozambique only for a few years. And the main thrust of their work is actually justice work, because there are so many people there who are on the, um, the wrong end, the, the wrong end of injustice. And they've been campaigning and working for justice. So we're going to go and encourage the team and support the team as well. So uh, before I start preaching, um, Hesiani, Pogiara, Paranos in Portuguese, por favor. Sim. The pastor is asking me to pray for you in Portuguese. You'd like me to pray for the church or for the trip? For the trip and for the church, and as we come to look at God's word. Okay. Obrigado. Deus, eu quero te louvar, Senhor, e te engrandecer, Pai, porque Tu és um Deus tremendo, Senhor. Pai, eu te louvo, Senhor, por cada vida aqui, Pai, na Tua presença, Pai, nesta manhã, Senhor. E te agradeço, Pai. Pela Tua bondade, Senhor, por cada um de nós, Senhor. Porque nós poderíamos estar em qualquer lugar, mas o Senhor nos escolheu para estar neste lugar. Para Te louvar Sim. e Te engrandecer o Teu santo nome, Senhor. Uhum. Pai, nós queremos Te louvar e Te engrandecer, Senhor, neste domingo, Senhor. 
E pedimos ao Pai a sua orientação, Pai, que o Senhor use o pastor David, Senhor, como um anjo, Senhor, neste lugar, Pai, para tocar nos nossos corações, Pai, para trazer uma palavra de vida, Senhor, que nos Amém. edifique, Senhor, em Amém. Ti, Senhor, em nome de Jesus. Pai, eu coloco em Tuas mãos, eu peço a viagem para Moçambique, Pai, que estamos planejando, Senhor, para fazer a Tua obra, Senhor. Pai, eu oro pela Tua provisão, Senhor. Hum. Pai, que tudo que seja necessário que o Senhor venha providenciar para nós, oh Pai, como, como um time, para a minha vida do pastor David, Senhor do Cris, Pai, que o Senhor venha estar conosco, hum. Senhor, o Senhor nos capacite, Senhor. Não pai, que o Senhor use nossas bocas neste lugar, naquele lugar, Senhor, para transformar aquelas vidas, Senhor. Sim. Que realmente, oh Pai, nós vamos lá, Pai, num propósito de fazer a diferença naquelas vidas, naquele lugar, Senhor. Sim. Amém. Pai, desde já, Senhor, nós oramos por aquelas vidas ali, Senhor. Pai, que o Senhor abra o coração delas, oh Pai, para receber aquilo que o Senhor tem para a vida delas, oh Pai, através das nossas vidas, Senhor. Pai, eu te agradeço, Senhor, porque é um privilégio, Pai, te servir, Senhor. Pai, obrigada, Senhor, porque o Senhor tinha colocado as responsabilidades em nossas vidas, Senhor, para ir lá e fazer a diferença, Pai, no meio daquele povo, Senhor. Pai, usa-nos, oh Pai. Assim como Jeremias falou, eis-me aqui, Senhor, usa-me usa a mim. Assim eu me coloco em Tua presença esta manhã, Senhor. Em nome de Jesus. Pai, eu oro por esse dia, Senhor, que o Senhor venha realmente nos abençoar nesse serviço, oh Pai. Derrama a Tua graça. O Teu sobrenatural, em nome de Jesus. Amém. 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 Obrigado. So Mozambique is a Portuguese-speaking country. Um, uh, Hegiani, as you just realized, uh, those of you that don't know her, her first language is Portuguese. So I speak Portuguese as well. Um, so Chris is going to have to um, keep up with the rest of us. <laughs> so that'll be interesting. The theme, the motto this year um, is, the Lord is a warrior. And uh, now, I, I'm sure that you, like me, believe that we're made in the image of God. Yes, yeah, I'm just, yeah, work with me here. So we're made in the image of God. So, it, we, which means that, um, so let's see if we can work out what a warrior looks like. Um, I feel there's a few volunteers. Warren! Oh, fantastic. Well volunteered. Let's look for a few more volunteers. Yes! You can stand up. Fantastic. Any more, any more? Uh, John, I think you'd make a good, good volunteer. Jibs, I think you'd make a good, good volunteer. I uh, see one or two people just sort of skulking down in their, in their, in their seats. Bowler! Yes! Fantastic! Well volunteered. So, um, I, w I wonder if you guys, if you could just give us just a quick demonstration. Just wait for a moment. Be patient. Be patient. I'm getting there. Just, just, just run with me. Okay. So, you know, if we're thinking about, about warrior images, so can, we, can we have some, some warrior poses, some warrior noises? Can, can you look a bit warrior-like? Can you make an effort at least? <laughs> okay, that'll do. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. But it seems to me they were actually all made in the image of God. Amen? Amen? So, if God is a warrior, it isn't just about being all Ugh! and male and, and whatever. So, so, let's think about this again. Can you stand up for me? Let's find some other warriors as we, as we look around, <laughs> shall we? Could you stand up for me? Can you stand up for me? Thank you. Let's find some other people around looking that, that could, be, could be warriors. Liz, could you stand up for me? Thank you very much. Um, oh, someone who loves sitting by the door over here. Would you mind standing up for me? Fantastic. So, it seems to me... Um, Regina, welcome back. It's the first time I've been here on a Sunday when you've been here, so you'll do as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is, am, I, am, I doing, am I doing better now? <laughs> Am I doing better now? Yeah, okay, that's right. <laughs> Just checking. So, it seems to me that these people are just as much in the image of God as warriors as these sort of semi-beefy guys that we had at the front. Do, do you agree with me? 
And I want to I look at that and explore that with you this morning, because I want to look today with you. You can sit down. Thank you very much. Round of applause for these wonderful people. I, I want to look today at one of or what I think, without doubt, is the greatest warrior in the Bible. The number one warrior in the Bible. And, and when we think about warriors, we have a particular image of what, of what warriors are like. But I want to suggest to you that actually our image may be incorrect in terms of what a warrior is really like. So we're going to look at this morning, we're going to look at a lot of the Bible together. We're going to look actually at 58 verses together. So lunch isn't for a couple of hours yet, is it? That's fine. That's good. The lasagna is still cooking apparently, so we've got loads of time. So if you'd like to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to look at a really well-known story. It's the story of David and Goliath. It's a really well-known story, but I actually think it's a massively misunderstood story. It's, it's a story that's uh, talked about in Sunday school, isn't it? It's a Sunday school favourite. You know, what should we do today? You've got nothing else to do. Let's do David and Goliath. But it's not actually a Sunday school story. It's a favourite for children, but it's not a children's story. And the downing of Goliath, which we are going to look at, only takes three of the 58 verses that tell the story. And I want us to work and to look at that today. I'll just say a little comment about the, the, the text here. We, we Europeans currently have a particular understanding of, of the nature of history which I won't go into all the details, but it actually is a modern invention. Um, the material we're looking at today is, is around 3,000 years old, and it was not written according to, according to the modern conventions of history. When you write history today, the most important thing is that you get the events in the right order on the timeline. But that's a very new way of looking at history. In fact, you go back a couple of hundred years, and nobody looked at history like that. It's, it's, a, it's a new way of, of thinking. This is not written according to that. The, this writer wrote under God's inspiration and anointing, not to give an historical account in the normal meaning of that word, but actually to show us how great God is and how we can trust God. Some people, when they read this chapter, they, they point out that there are some tensions between this chapter and, and the last chapter, particularly the ending of the last chapter, but it didn't actually bother the author too much. So I don't think it should bother us to say that in passing. Now, for those of you that, that either have got short memories or those of you who weren't here the last time that I, I preached, I, 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 have a, I have a habit when I'm preaching that I ask questions. And uh, when I ask questions, I actually then stop and listen to the answers. So they're not rhetorical questions. So you're going to work with me as we look at this passage together. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, some of you nodded. You're going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. That's right. I'm going to do it anyway. So let's begin with uh, chapter 17 and verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and they assembled at Succah in Judah and they, they pitched camp at Ephes Damium between Succah and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he wore a coat of scale armour of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. I'll explain that in a moment. On his legs he wore bronze greaves. He had a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. And its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went 
in front of him. Now the Philistines were long-standing enemies of Israel and this battle was right on the border between Israel and the nation of the Philistines, Philistia. Now Goliath's armour was, was impressive. This, this coat of scale armour, scale armour was when you have a huge piece of, of leather and you fix to the leather pieces of, of metal. So it's like the scales of an animal. His armour weighed 57 kilos. That's 126 pounds. That's nine stone. That's not much different from my weight. That was just the scale armour he had. And he, he carried a javelin. The head of that spear weighed eight kilos. That's 18 pounds. That's a stone and four pounds. So, you know, you've got whatever. So, I mean, this is a seriously big guy with a seriously impressive armour and a seriously big spear. Goliath stood, verse 8, and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So I want you to imagine the scene. We've got these two armies now on opposite sides of this. They're, they're lined up and, and every morning they sort of line up just to show their forces to one another. And out from the ranks of the Philistines, every day comes this nine foot high man wearing his armour, carrying his spear. And he says to the Israelites, good morning, how are you today? Why don't one of you come out here and fight me? There seemed to be a slight shortage of volunteers. I, I wonder what you think. I want you to try and imagine now that you're one of the Israelites. Men and women. I mean, there were no women in the army, but, you know, women, I want you to do this as well. Men and women, I want you to imagine that you're there. So you're standing there. You've, you've got your armour on. You've got your spear. And you're standing there. And you're opposite this Philistine army. And uh, out comes Goliath and issues his challenge. And you're pretty sure he looks you in the eye. That's if you're not already looking down at the ground. <laughs> as he looks around. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's going on inside you? What do you think? I'll be like, oh, who shall we send? <laughs> not me. <laughs> yeah. What else? What's going on? I'm like a grasshopper. One foot and I'm done for. Mm -hmm. So this is a new way that, is, that the army, if I'm in an army, I'll fight as an army, but as an individual, I ain't going to go there. <laughs> they probably thought we don't stand a chance. We've got to do something. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to do something. We are dead before the fight even started. Mm -hmm. Dead before the fight even started. You see, the Israelites 
the army had actually lost the plot. They were completely intimidated, <clears throat> completely immobilised. There was something really, really important that they'd forgotten. It's a guy called Brueggemann, who's one of my favourite commentators on this passage. I'm going to quote him a few times. And he, he wrote this. Goliath did indeed have the whole armour. Okay, all the Israelites saw that. But what they didn't see was what Brueggemann wrote next. But it was not the whole armour of God. Amen. He had the whole armour, but it was not the whole armour of God. God. So we now come, next bit of the story, six weeks now. Goliath has been coming out every day. So six weeks, that's how many days? 42. 42, yeah. So 42 times, 42 mornings, he stood there and issued this challenge. That's a month and a half. That's quite a long period of time. So we pick up the story in verse 12. Now, David was the son of an Ethratite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening. How many times is that? How many times is that? 84, yeah, it's not 42. 84, morning and evening. Keep up, Timmy. Do you do the church accounts? Oh, excellent. Okay, just, just checking. So Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry along to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning... David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. I don't think they probably shouted with a great deal of enthusiasm. But they did do it every day, twice a day. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up in their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. So we're now six weeks or so on. They haven't found a volunteer yet. By the way, whose job should it have been to go and fight Goliath? Anybody know? It should have been the king, shouldn't it? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll find him in a moment, hiding in a corner of his tent. We'll, we'll come across him in, in a few minutes. Now, I want you to think now. Imagine you're David. So you're, we don't know exactly how old David was here, but probably he was a teenager. We're guessing. So let's imagine he was 14 or 15 years old. 
I, I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating slightly, but we know he was young. So let's say 14 or 15 years old. So he's been out looking after the sheep, and now he's taking the supply run to go and take some food for his brothers, who for six weeks have been stuck there in this battle line, every morning and evening coming out, and you, you get the picture. I want you to imagine that you're David. So 14, 15 year old lad. Now for some of you, you know, it's a, got to go back a long way in your memory, back to the time when you were 14 or 15. And some of you, of course, I recognise were never a 14, 15 year old lad. But, you know, you'll, you'll have to do your best in the circumstances. So I want you to imagine, go back and think now. Imagine that you're coming into the camp, the battle camp. You're 14, 15 years old. And you're bringing some supplies for your big brothers. You're coming into the camp and everyone's getting ready and they're getting into their battle lines. What do you think you might have been thinking or feeling in that situation? Yeah. Very excited. Mm -hmm. Every boy's dream, isn't it? Yeah, go there with the, with the army. So very excited. Yeah, what else? Not quite how I get over to that corner. I've changed the layout since I was last here. Let me, let me go all around over here. I think he'd be excited because he'd heard the stories of the uh, Israelite army, which was the army of God. So he's probably kind of like, why are they not being so loud in their shouts as well? He's a little confused because he's got the assurity of a teenage man who's been raised in the stories of the Israelite army. Mm-hmm, Yeah. Because the Israelite army is the army of, yeah, it's God's army. So what else do you think might have been going on for him as he, as he came into the camp? So there's this, this boyish excitement, yeah, to be with, with, with the army. There's this just puzzlingness going on, yeah? I'm really going to see some good fighting now. <laughs> yeah, it's like going to the cinema, isn't it? And seeing a good war movie, and I'm really going to see all of that, so yeah. Well, I, I think um, young um, men... Uh, which he would have been considered. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they don't see that as much danger as you... The older you get, the more sort of danger you f feel. And I, are, are you an expert on that now? Well, age. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, like, I, I think that, you know, he was just... He was excited. It's like uh, Fiona just said, like, oh, Lord's army, this and that. And he'd been in the fields you know, with his father's sheep, like, you know, there's dangers out there. That's why they had shepherds and, uh, like, you know, wild animals and stuff like that. And I, I, I just think he, he, he looked at him and weighed him up and thought, he saw his weak spot and thought he'd been out in the desert, like, using his catapult, killing birds and stuff like that, because that's what young guys do when they're out in the countryside in them days, even now. Uh, yeah, and he thought, hey, you know what? I can take him out. I'm good at this. Yeah, um, hmm. Okay, interesting speculation. I'm not quite so sure he was there. So you're going to have to lean this way. I think, he's, I think he's probably in two minds because part of him wants to respond to this situation. He, he might have some kind of hunch that he can. But on the other hand... He's the littlest. Mm -hmm. He's the littlest. And he knows that people are going to say to him, no, you're not important enough. You're too small. You're too this. You're too that. Um, and who knows? Part of him might have been inclined to believe that as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, I agree with most of that. I, I, I have a... There's no... I have no evidence in the Bible for this, okay? But I have... I have some other speculation as well about what was going on for David as he came into the camp. I think all of that is true. Overwhelmed by the activity, the noise, probably stunned a bit by the, the sight of Goliath. But I have a suspicion that as he came into the camp and as he saw Goliath, I think he began to feel something of God's presence and anointing just beginning to come on him. Because we, we know that, that David 
was someone who God presenced himself with. Remember, back in those days, there was no Holy Spirit given. People didn't have God's presence with them normally. It was, it was a, a very special thing. And I, I think that, that that was there, which is, I think, a bit behind what happened next. So let's go with the story. Verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He would also give his daughter in marriage. And, nice bonus, will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. <laughs> David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Notice that phrase. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living gods? They repeated to him what they've been saying and told him. This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? Well, with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. <laughs> what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Now notice here what the issue is for David. Look carefully. Notice the issue. The issue, verse 26, is very clear. It's about God's honour. It's about the honour of the living God. It is his army that's apparently being defied. And this question that he asks is a very deep, penetrating question. Because the real issue here that's at stake is about the reality or otherwise of the God of Israel. It's nothing less than that. It's the reality or otherwise of the God of Israel. Who is it that's got the power here? Is it the gods of Gath, the Philistine capital? Or is it the living God of Israel? Who really is God? That's the issue here. So time to do some more imagining. I, I want you to imagine that, that you're one of David's oldest three brothers. And your youngest brother has just turned up, bought some food, news from his father, left his sheep. Well, what do you think might have been going on in their minds as they looked at and listened to their little brother. And he was very little. I think there's a number of things. I mean, I think that, that phrase that David used, what have I done now, I was only asking a question, actually begs how he was asking the question because I think that um, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? His brothers were probably reacting to the way he was asking that question because he wasn't asking, oh, what, what's Saul going to give me if I can kill him? He was asking something else. Mm -hmm. And that was becoming very clear. And so the brothers were already irritated with David because he was the one that was anointed to be king of Israel. And now he's sticking a spoke in their wheel. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? That's a very long and comprehensive answer. <laughs> if 
if I was one of David's eldest brother, I would probably be thinking, we might be dead today. Does it, is it what my youngest brother dying as well with us today? Okay, yeah. If I'm Eliab, David, David turning up is my worst nightmare. Particularly if he's going to be enthused about the idea of defending God's honour. Because for six weeks, I haven't been up to that. And I haven't wanted to do that. And I'm too scared to do that. And here's my little brother that I would like to belittle but I can't because he's up for something that I'm not up for. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Brueggemann, who I quoted from earlier on, he's got a great sentence here about David's brothers. I, I agree with all that you've said. They say this, David's brothers do not recognize that he is the wave of the future. They don't recognize that David is the wave of the future. So let's follow the story through, because what happens next is just, if you've not read the story before, is, is just bizarre. Really, when you step back from it and think about it, it really is quite bizarre. David said to Saul, okay, just, you know, so we've got 14, 15 year old lad, shepherd, just turned up at the battle, okay, bring some provisions for his brothers a bit earlier in the day. So this perhaps now we're we're talking about lunchtime, early afternoon. So so we've got him. And who's he talking to? He's talking to the king of Israel. You know, the king. Not a king, the king. And in those days, I mean, he was the absolute bloke in charge. There, there, There wasn't like our very nice queen we've got now, who actually it's parliament that's in charge, really. Not in those days, it, it was the king. He, he had the power of life and death over absolutely everybody in Israel. Totally, completely powerful. So, this is a conversation between David and Saul. So David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Remember, nine foot tall, armour weighing nine stone, Thumping great javelin, your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, and I think not unreasonably, you're not able to go out and fight this Philist- against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. It's quite reasonable. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, "Um, go and the Lord be with you. (laughs) I mean, this is just a really bizarre conversation. You know, the fact that Saul sent for David just shows how desperate Saul was. You know, 
14, 15 year old lad coming into the king's tent because he's heard this guy's offering to go and top the Philistine. Utterly desperate. But notice how David, I, I, I'm really struck by this. He, he doesn't talk about what a great warrior he is. Mm -mm. He just gives a simple testimony to God's faithfulness and then just stated his own trust in the living God. There's an interesting principle here, by the way. You know, sometimes we think, particularly leaders, churches, individuals, we, you know, we, we see some, some battle in some public arena that we think we're going to engage with and, and get involved with and, and see God's will be done and God's kingdom come and, and all of that. And, and I'm up for that, as you'll hear in a while. But we've never actually done any fighting in the private place first. Here's the interesting thing about David. He was able to go into the public arena and fight these battles. You can't get much more public than what we're going to see in a few minutes' time because on his own with God, he'd won the battles. He was able to do the stuff in public because... It was just an extension of who he was in private. He didn't have any audience when he fought the bear or fought the lion. It was just him and God. And he had that confidence in God because in that private sphere, he had been faithful to God and God had been faithful to him. So now he could look at this public sphere and think, what's the difference? I feel a bit sorry for Saul on one level. On another level, I don't feel sorry for him at all because actually it's his own fault that he's where he is. But I'm pretty sure that as, as Saul stood there with David in front of him, I mean, he was backed into a corner without doubt. I mean, what else can you say other than, uh, well, go and the Lord be with you? I mean, he's backed into a corner here. But I, deep down... I'm sure Saul knew that actually he should have been going in the power of God. And he knew that he no longer had the power of God because he had gone outside of God's will. And God had rejected him as king because of his fairly public rebellion against God that's recounted earlier in the book. He had lost his empowering by God. It gets even weirder, this next bit. Saul dressed David in his own tunic. This is the king putting his armour on a 15-year-old lad to go and fight on behalf of the nation of Israel. It's a little strange. He put a coat of armour on him, a bronze helmet on his head. David, David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking. Because he wasn't used to them. I can't go in these, he said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. There's a big principle here about us in the Christian life, by the way. You see... Saul tried to fit David into Saul's own shape or mould. 
He wanted David to go out looking like he would have gone, with all his kit and armour. But it was vitally important that David was who he was in God and not someone else. Let's go back to where we started with that fun I had with the men earlier on and the uh, other warriors that we identified in the church. You see, if we have an image in our minds of, of what a warrior in God looks like and that it's like one of these big he-men type people, we, we can think that, well, actually, if I'm going to fight God's battles and, and the Lord is a warrior and calls us, you know, we've got a calling as a warrior church, I've somehow got, got to be like one of these big, strong warrior types. We can end up not being the person who God has made us to be. And we're actually immobilised immobilized, unable to do what God wants us to do because actually we're trying to be somebody else. David couldn't be Saul. He was going in Saul's place because it was actually Saul's job to go and do this because he was the king. But he had to be himself. And there's this really important principle here, because we're actually all different, aren't we? I mean, just look around. Have a quick look around. Probably don't notice anybody just quite like you. <laughs> but God has made you who you are. Hello? God's made you who you are. God's anointed and gifted you who you are. God's called you who you are. We sang a song earlier on, that song which you taught today, which I never heard before. Song, yeah. Yeah. It's who we are. And as we go and do the things that God asks us to do, we go as who we are in God, not as somebody else. We've got Pastor Warren. Do stand up. There's my friend. There we go. You know, God's called Pastor Warren to a particular role and place as a warrior, as a warrior pastor, part of a warrior church. And, and he is who he is in God, and that's absolutely right. Do stay there. No, I didn't say you could sit down. I'm the visitor today. I can do what I like. Could you stand up for me again? Do you mind? No. Thank you very much. Okay, here's another warrior. Amen. A great warrior in this church, a prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest prayer warriors in this church, incidentally, here. Now, if my sister Herman here thinks that as a warrior she's got to be like Warren over there, <laughs> my, is she going to be in trouble? They're both warriors, but actually they are both very, very different. And they're called to be themselves in God. So, uh, you know, Warren, we're not going to expect Warren to try and be like Herman, or Herman to try and be like Warren. But because Warren's at the front, we can think, well, actually, maybe we should try and be a bit more like Pastor Warren. Shout like he shouts, pray like he prays. Nothing wrong with the shouting and the praying, but I don't hear my sister Herman doing that because that's not who she is in God. Do sit down. Thank you so much. You've been wonderfully helpful. Get a round of applause for Herman and a ripple for Warren as well. You see, the principle here is being who you are in God. And David was not in human terms built like a warrior at this point in his life. He'd never done any warrior training, we know that. He killed the odd lion and bear, yeah. He was a shepherd. If you'd seen him, you'd think, shepherd boy. He had his shepherd clothes with him. When he went out to fight Goliath, what was he wearing? Shepherd's clothes. 
what he wore out in the field when he was looking after the sheep. He had the shepherd's pouch with him with some stones in it. He was just who he was in God. Verse 41. Meanwhile, so now we've got the battle underway now. We've got the big nine foot tall Philistine, great big armour, thumping great javelin spear. He had a shield as well. He actually had someone else to carry his shield for him. The shield bearer walked in front of him with the shield. So the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy. Ruddy, that's an old word for red, and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. <laughs> I like this next bit. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. Notice not this day, I'm going to beat you. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me. And I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hand. This wasn't an ordinary battle. This was a battle about the honour of the living God. And, and Goliath made the classic error of judging by the outside appearance. <laughs> what he missed was, as another writer put it, Klein, David came in the name of the Lord of hosts. You know, when God calls us into battle, whose name do we go in? The Lord of hosts. And we need to remember that. We don't go in our own strength. It's not about how big and muscly we are in a spiritual sense or a physical sense. It is about the fact we go in God's name. Whatever situation we're in, whatever we're facing, we face it in God's name. We go in the power and name of the Lord of hosts. Now, I'm, I'd like us to do a, a little practice um, because I, I want some sound effects in a moment so a little practice so could you stand for a moment this is just a practice we'll do the real one in a minute but but I, I do know that sometimes people are a bit a bit slow so what I want you to practice is shouting a huge cheer I'm going to count to three that I want a huge cheer is, is, is that okay yeah. one two three yeah. it won't surprise you to know that that's not good enough <laughs> One, two, three. Yay! We're getting there. One more practice. One, two, three. Yay! Very good. You can stand, stand standing. Okay. That's the one. Yes. <laughs> Stay standing. So, when I tell you, big cheer, all right? As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it 
and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face to the ground. One, two, three. You may sit down. David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard and he killed him. He cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. The men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout. They pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath, to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharon Road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Gory bit coming now, warning. David took the Philistine head and brought it to Jerusalem and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. I think he walked along to Jerusalem carrying the head like this, you know. Just, I don't know. Maybe that's just... Anyway. Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine. He said to Abner, commander of the army, whose son is that young man? He was obviously getting ready to write the, the little form to exempt the, uh, from taxes. That was a joke. Find out whose son that is. As soon as... David returned from killing the Philistine. Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I'm the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. Now, this is a dramatic example of how God can give the person of faith victory over impossible odds. I wonder this morning, brothers and sisters, I wonder what giants you're facing in your family. You don't need to say anything out loud. Just put it up in your mind. What, what giants you're facing in your circumstances, family, finance, employment. Wherever it is that you are facing giants, I, I wonder what they are. You know, sometimes those giants that face us can seem so huge that we, like Israel, are intimidated. We're immobilized. We lose the plot that we are serving the Lord of hosts, the living God. We forget that it's in his name that we go into battle. The truth is that God is the living God. Amen. Amen. And that he is able to deliver. Amen. Amen. And that he wants to give his people victory. Amen. Amen. In every situation, in every circumstance, in everything that we face, God wants to give his people the victory. He calls us to battle. Let's stand together, shall we? I want you to, I invite you to stand. It's not compulsory, but invite you to. I, I'd like you to, to think for a moment and just pull up into your mind what some of the biggest giants that you're facing at the moment. Just pull them up into your mind. Just think about them. And I, and I want you just to imagine for a moment that you're like David. So you're, I don't know, inexperienced teenager. And you've got this humongous, great giant that's facing you at the moment. And I want you to understand that you go against that giant in the name of the Lord of hosts. Not in your own strength, not in someone else's armour, not in anybody else's name, but in the name of the Lord 
of hosts. I'm going to pray in a moment and pray for you. Uh, it, it may be that there's something that surfaced for you that you would like individual prayer for. Then after I finished, you can come if you wish to. Come and find me. Come and find Warren or Timmy or Rangina here and uh, allow them to pray with you and for you if you'd find that helpful. Father God, we thank you for this story that we've looked at today in your living word. We thank you that it is as true today as it was 3,000 years ago. That you still are the living God. And that you still call us and equip us and enable us for victory. That the forces of darkness that are arraigned against us in whatever situation, whatever circumstances, we stand in the name of the living God. And thank you that you promise victory for us. Father, help us to find faith to be ourselves in you, to do what you call us to do, to do what you ask us to do, that in every situation, in every circumstance, you in us will have the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.